Okay, I'm going to share my screen. So what you'll see here is um, my my uh, homepage in Flow, and I'm going to filter all my flows so it only contains the flows that can that start with the words "drop in." Um, actually, this is just a, this is just the first 25 of them. I think I've got about 40 of these now. The topic for today, we're going to talk about point per value. Um, and as always here, I'm going to do this in the edit mode rather than the present mode. So I'll be able to explain some things by looking at the, uh, at the editor artifacts as we're, as we're going through this. And um, this is the first time I'm, I'm using a different data set this time. I'm not using a life expectancy data set that you've now seen at least 26 times. Um, this particular data set that I'm going to be using, just going to take a look at it here. It's a, it's a data set designed to have a lot of columns and a lot of rows. So, and it, and it's for sales order information. So I've got 9,994 rows in this data set. So about 10,000, I got about 21 columns of data and it has to, it all has to do with ordering products that are in categories and subcategories. So I've got order date, I've got ship date, uh, I've got country and city and state. Um, I've got over here, I've got the category, product category, whether it's furniture or office supplies or whatever. I got subcategory, which we're actually we're gonna look at today a lot. I got the product name and the sales, sales amount. So I get 10,000 records with sales amounts in them. So a pretty substantial data set kind of not unlike uh, maybe a typical large data set that you guys um, at one point or another will be dealing with. So let me, let me tell you what point per value is. And what I've done here, I'm just using a button here in, in Flow. And I'm, by pressing this button, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna make this vanish and I'm gonna make a text object show up. Okay, so just a typical uh, use of, um, an, a button causing an action there. So as you all know, who've been to these sessions before or have worked in flow, normally a dot in a flow visualization represents a row within the data source in, or your CSV file. Okay? Um, point per value overrides this in a way that the number of dots that are generated is in proportion to the value of a designated numeric data element. So if I had a $100,000 in sales, let's say, and I've defined the sales uh, field to be the instigator of my point per value, and I assign a $1,000 per sales item, that means there's going to be 100 dots represented by that single data point. So the point, so the number of dots to be generated is in proportion to the value of the designated numeric data element. An important point to know is that point per value is a swarm attribute. And within a swarm, the visualizations must be either point per row or point per value. You can't mix them in a, in a, in a uh, swarm. So what this means is if in your presentation, if some of your fields need to be visualized using point per row, which we normally do, but others need to be used, uh, visualized using point per value, you need to use different swarms for those two visualizations. And this, this should not be a problem as any number of swarms can be driven from the same data source, the same CSV file, if you will. So <clears throat> that's some of the rules of the game for uh, point per value. So these next few steps, I just want to show you what, an, what kind of an issue you can encounter when you're, when you're using a visualized way of expressing the volume of, uh, of data elements. So here's my 10,000 dots. See, these are, um, this, is, this is a simple scatter plot that shows for each of the uh, subcategories I'm dealing with over time, the value of the sales point. So a lot of these sales points are less than $2,000 in sales, the great majority of them. And there are a few outliers, like here's an $18,000 sale. So that's what my data looks like. So if I come along here and I want to visualize this data in using our categorized columns, 
And this particular swarm here, I, I'm doing it in the normal way where each point represents a row in the data set. So I'm gonna have 10,000 points in this categorized column chart. So there's an issue here um, in that I've got a huge number of points and they're running off the top of the screen. So uh, let's, let's just uh, quick, take a quick look here. Uh, well, first of all, the, the categorized columns, it's the category column is subcategory. And I've used the defaults here. I'm using five, five dots for, for each uh, row in these columns of data. And I haven't changed this at all, it's just defaults, okay? So now let's see what happens here. This is gonna appear jumpy on Zoom, I'm sure. But what I'm doing here is I'm scrolling up to the top of these columns. So some of these columns are very large. They go way off the screen because there's so many dots. So there's two problems with this use of categorized columns in this particular use case. One is there's a huge number of dots. Okay? And the second is that each dot represents a row in the data source, which means it's a sales event, not of not the value of the sales or any other field in the in the data set. So if you're counting events, this is great. If you're not counting events though, and you want the sales amounts, then that's that's the clue that uh, using um, point per value is a good way to good way to go. So what to do about this? What we're going to do is we're going to see how using point per value can help in this visualization of sales by subcategory. So what I'm going to do here in my going from step four to five, I'm going to switch to a new data set here. <clears throat> and in this particular data set, let me just show you the, the data first. What I did is I, using regular Excel techniques, all I did is I summarized all this data. I have 17 subcategories. And what I did is I generated, um, I just summarized the data. And I did this this time around in an external CSV file. I'm gonna show you a little bit later how you can use the, um, the built-in um, uh, data source manipulation within Flow to do the same thing. So I've got 17 records and uh, these are the total sales. And the total sales, you know, they, well, this first one was 167,000. Okay, and the next one was 107,000. So um, significant number of volumes of sales for each subcategory. So that's the data. It's only two columns, so a very simple data set. Okay, now what, I, what you're seeing here is the normal display of the dots in the swarm. And what we're used to seeing is a dot for every row in the CSV file. Well, my CSV file only has 17 rows. Clearly, there's more than 17 dots here. The, the way I've defined this, um, the point per value here is I'm saying, take, go to the total sales column. That's the column that's going to drive my dots. And each point equals a thousand dollars in sales. So I don't know, I'm not sure how many dots are in here, but it's, it's probably somewhere between 500 and a thousand dots. And, and each dot represents a thousand dollars in sales, even though there's only 17 records in the CSV file. So let's see what we can do with this. Well, okay, I used exactly the same categorized columns, subcategory, I think I kept all the same defaults here. Um, and what I get out of here is all the columns are fitting nicely into the screen. And the columns are in ex the exact proportion of the volume of sales for each of these subcategories. So accessories has this volume, Appliances has this volume, art has smaller volume, envelopes, fasteners, labels are all low volume items, phones are a high volume item, and chairs are a high volume item. And they might not be high volume in number of transactions, but they are high value in the number of dollars generated in sales. So in this way, I get a really great looking chart that tells me what the volumes of sales are for each of these for each of these subcategories. Okay. Uh, this next step, I'm just going to show you. So, you know, this is bare bones. I haven't, I've just taken the out of the box categorized columns to show this. So then as you go on and as you're tweaking your, your presentation, maybe you want to add color 
to these different categories. Maybe you want to put labels up here that show the dollar volumes. Um, you can enliven your, your presentation using color. Um, I put some additional curvature into, into the way these columns are displayed. So if you were to, uh, if you were to swivel your camera position here, you get a feeling of curvature of these columns. Okay. Um, and I put the, okay, I put the labels on. I made the fonts larger just so they're a little bit more readable and the like. So anyway, this is just sprucing up. In step seven, I spruced up this data that I generated in step six. So very straightforward use, using categorized columns of point per value. Let me pause here and just ask if there are any questions here before I go on to my next two steps that have to do with generating this from the original data set within flow. Bill, can you just quickly show the, so the color, uh, you said it column by subcategory? Yeah, yeah, the color here. Okay, what I did here is just to make it easy. I didn't try anything fancy here. I put, I made, I chose one of our built-in color schemes, the default color scheme. And I, de I decided to color by subcategory. So each time a row is read from this data file, which only contains 17 records, um, a, a different color is assigned to that category. Got it. So nothing fancy, nothing fancy there. Um, if I, if I wanted to really get very tight control over the exact colors for each of these subcategories. Maybe I would have put the colorization into the into the CSV file, or maybe I would have defined my own custom color scheme. So, so in this case, I just took the a very easy way and three clicks, and I had this color. Okay. Any any other questions here? Okay. Well, um, so uh, this may be nitpicking, but. Uh, I'm looking at the, the on the right side of the property pane, the chart, um, the ca uh, categorized uh, columns uh, using subcategory, and the, it says using five points per column. Um, I'm assuming that means the the width of those columns in there is five dots, right? Five five points. Right. Um, that 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 that, that pertains to these five dots right here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, it, it wouldn't that be five points per row? Oh, yeah, it really is. Yeah, this really should be using five points and constructing a row of each column. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, because I got confused a little bit. I was like, five, <laughs> what does it mean by five points per column? Now I, I, I then I counted, I realized that's just the width of that column. That should be five points per row. But that, yeah. That yeah, thanks. Al. Actually, you know what? I'm so used to seeing this. I, I don't even notice that anymore. But I'll, I'll put in a little note to our engineering group, maybe change that that uh, text just a little bit. Thanks. Let me just take a second and write it down. Points per column, uh, change to something a little bit better description. Yep. And we've had one other session, I think, oh, maybe three months ago on uh, categorized columns. So there's another session here that delves deeply into the categorized columns. This 0.08, that's this gap right here. And it's arranged in a circle with a, with a one meter radius. So this is a pretty big circle. Um, and this radio offset's an interesting one. It's, the, it's what I set, so I, I had it by default structured like this. If I had had this at a different angular offset, I, maybe I would have gotten an initial view that looks something like that. So putting the minus 19 in there just brought the circle around. So I'm viewing it kind of straight into the middle of my, uh, of my display. Okay, uh, any other questions before I go on? <clears throat> okay, next step. <clears throat> what we're gonna do is instead of generating a separate CSV file and using Excel to do these aggregation, let's generate a snapshot of, from the master data file that and in, in the snapshot, let's summarize the sales by subcategory. Okay, so <clears throat> what I'm going to do here is I'm going to make this a separate swarm because it is going to be a it's going to it's going to be a uh, uh, point per uh, 
point per value rather than point per row. So I've got I've got a new swarm here. I can't use this first swarm that I'm using that uses the same data data set. So new swarm, swarm number three. The data set that I'm using is many columns, many rows. That's my original data set. I'm just going to take a look at that real quick. This is the one with um, 19 or 9,994 rows. Okay. Now, the very first thing I did was in order to generate a subcategory, subcategory snapshot summarization, what I did is I took my subcategory field here in my data set, I clicked on it and I moved it up here. And in doing that, all I was telling, all I was telling the flow data source manipulator is, hey, what I want to do, I want to generate summarized records by subcategory. And immediately after I did that, this is what I saw on my screen. So I've got my 17 subcategories and I've got information about how many records are in each of those subcategories. So even that might be useful information. Okay. And if I wanted to look inside any of these, I just, I just click on this right facing arrow here and I can expand. So here's my 228 bookcases records here that, were, that are in my original data file. Okay. So I'm going to collapse this again, just so I have everything nice and clean. So in my point per value summarization, I want to get myself in a position where I have two fields. One field is the category, the subcategory, and the other field is the volume of sales. So I purposely left all these blank fields in here because this is what I saw right after I did this summarization. But let me scroll over to the right. And by the way, I can make these fields disappear by unchecking them here but I've chosen not to do that for this example, just so I take you back to what I originally did here. The next thing I did is I scrolled over and I found my subcategory, my subcategory field here. And I simply did this and it was unpopulated, had nothing in it. What I did is I clicked this little hamburger icon, which gives me some choices of things I can do with that column. And I went down to the value aggregation and I clicked the word first. Okay, now I'm well trained in flow um, and that's why I, I knew to do that. Okay, what this does is it takes the first record in this, yeah, it takes the first of these 228 records and it takes the value of subcategory and puts it in that place in this, in this uh, particular table. Okay, actually, I could have said last, they would have gotten bookcases also. The point is, though, in order to populate the items in this particular column, um, you do have to do something. And using first is a kind of a classic way of getting the volume or is getting the value that is the subcategory. So that's how, that's how I populated that field. Okay, now I also wanted to get the summar summarization of all the sales. So this was blank. What I did is I came over here, I clicked my hamburger icon and I did my value aggregation again. And here I didn't want average count, first, last, max, min. I did want the sum though. I clicked sum and immediately I got this information here. So it, it immediately summarized the sales for each of these subcategories. So now what I've got is I've got my two, two column, CSV file that I want to use to generate my categorized column summary. So it took, uh, you know, so far probably 10 clicks to get to this point. Um, then what I did is I created a snapshot and it, it, gave, it was given the default name of snapshot number one. And I was done. That's all, that's all I did in manipulating this data to get myself in a position where I have these two fields that I want to spin up in my categorized column uh, chart. Another, uh, another good thing about doing it this way is if I come in here and at some point I refresh my primary data set, which is this one here, this is the raw data. If I come, say I've, I've gotten an update and I refresh this, by uh, 
along with the refresh operation, I'm always I'm also going to refresh my uh, my snapshot number one. So all sorts of good reasons for using the flow uh, data massager to uh, generate your your snapshot. Okay, so I've got snapshot one here. So now let's see what I did here over in defining the swarm here. Okay, so here's my swarm definition. I'm using as my data source, I'm using this many columns, many rows to.csv file, but flow also asks if you're going to be using a snapshot, if a snapshot exists. And I say, yes, I want to use snapshot number one. So this becomes my data source for this visualization I'm going to, I'm going to do. Then what I did is I said, okay, this visualization is going to be point per value not point per row, it's going to be point per value. I selected that and then flow came back and said, okay, point per value, what's the column that's going to contain these values? I selected sales and then it says each point is going to represent how many uh, dollars of sales and I put in a thousand. Now, if I put in one here, and I think one might be the default actually, but if I had put in one, I would have gotten a message from Flow saying, hey, you just, you're trying to generate too many dots. We just can't cope with the number of dots you're trying to generate, millions of dots. So, you know, I, I just decided I was gonna choose a thousand because I had a hunch that was gonna fit nicely on the screen, but I could have chosen any other number. I think maybe I started with a hundred and I found the dots we're just going off the screen, so I, I upped it to a thousand. Okay. So anyway, this is how I define my point per value, and then I came down to my categorized columns. I selected that as the chart type, and my category column is subcategory. I left all of these other things pretty much in the default uh, orientation. <clears throat> I did notice that when I had my members here, they were not in alphabetical order because they were not in alphabetical order in my source file. So I just click this sort button and I say, hey, sort by alphabetical within the column of subcategory in ascending order. And that's how I got accessories, applications, art. I got this chart. Um, I, I got this chart uh, displayed based on this simple categorized column uh, specification. So Remember step six, we saw this, we saw this chart. Um, let's see, let's see if this is exactly the same as what I had encountered in the chart in step six. Well, I could go back to step six if I wanted to and show you that and then flip back to step nine and show you that. Instead, what I decided to do here is I did a screenshot of step six and I put it into an image that I'm going to show you right now by clicking this button. So this button says, hey, display this invisible image, this image that exists on this step, but it's not visible, toggle it into its visible state. So this is the actual screenshot I took of step six. So we can compare it easily with step nine here, uh, which is using the, uh, the uh, different, uh, differently contrived data source. And if you compare these charts, they're exactly the same. Every dot, every dot on every bar is exactly the same. So, you know, so I think what I've proven here is using the built-in data massaging tools within Flow generates exactly the same result as if you went out into Excel and did your summary there and then use that as your data source. Okay. And I think that's all I want to. Uh, I think that's all I wanted to demonstrate here. So. We've gone through point per value, and as an adjunct to that, I took that as a really good excuse for demonstrating how you can use the, uh, the data source manipulator within Flow. So let me open it up for questions, on, either on this topic or any other topic. Okay, uh, let's see, let's see well, um, how I know you've been to several of these sessions. Let me know if there's anything else you wanna talk about. And Nate, uh, did you, uh, I don't recall you being in, in some other sessions, maybe you have been, I'm not sure, but does this, uh, 
did this all make sense? Uh, was it for where you are in your flow development? Uh, did this make sense to you? It did actually. Yeah, thank you. This was really helpful. Uh, really interesting. Um, I want to uh, try some of this <laughs> with my own stuff. Um, I'm really new. I, I'm just have just started playing with the tool, but um, yeah, yeah where, where, where about are you located? I'm in Maine. In Maine? Yeah, I work for the University of Maine at Augusta. Oh, good. Okay, good. Okay, I lived yeah. many years in Boston. I used Did to you? go to Drake's Island in southern Maine that had the best body surfing area oh, wow. cool. in New England. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I love the Drake's Island beach. Oh, man. Perfect <laughs> beach. Never been there. That's cool. <laughs> uh, how are you back in China or are you still in the U.S. for the summer? Oh, I'm, I'm in Ohio right now. Uh, we're going back uh, probably uh, mid-July. Well, we had a flight in, uh, in uh, early July, after 4th of July, but uh, that got uh, triggered a circuit breaker um, because there are cases on the previous flight. So anyway, there's complicated rules going into China. So we're, oh, wow. we're now looking at a later part of July going back. Oh, is that right? Okay. Okay. Well, hey, welcome. I actually have a question, Bill. Yep. Um, not like... Uh, for the main topic that yeah, uh, we're here, but I saw uh, in the process of um, you demonstrating this, um, you had these, um, I think they're probably buttons and then you click on it and then it, it, it shows another um, like a, a pop-up box. And um, I think that's a useful feature. Can you show us how you did it? Yes, and I think there is a session of these that is dedicated to actions and buttons. Yeah, you know, there were three places in this presentation that I put some buttons in here just to, you know, just to give a little uh, sizzle to my presentation here. A button is, is defined like any other object within the flow editor. So here I'm clicking on button number three. This is the definition of button number three. First of all, it's got a label, image of prior step. That's this label here this label here, um, and it has an action that's associated with it. And the particular action that I chose for this step is toggle, hide, or show. And what I had done is when I set up this step, I had an image here that was, let's see, let me show you the image. It's above the text, actually. I have an image here, image number one, I had made it invisible on this step. It's there, but it's invisible. If I were to make it visible here, I'm just gonna toggle it on. This is the image. I just toggled it on so it's visible. But by default on this step, I had set it to be invisible. So you can't, you can't see the image. And then I had set this button up. So let me go back to the button definition again. This button is set up. So then when I click the button, I toggle the hider show for image number one. So when I specified the action as being toggle hider show, flow came up and it said, okay, what, what object do you want to toggle? And I said, I just want to toggle image number one, which is that image I just showed you. So now when clicking this button, I can toggle showing of this image back and forth. So kind of a specialized action, you know, kind of a, it, it's just uh, useful for me in this particular presentation as I introduce topics. I wanted just by clicking a single button on a given step to make additional things happen. So that's what, that's how I use the button there. Very cool. Very cool. So the buttons control actions. Actions can be either very simple or quite complex. Um, if like if an example here, if I come into my actions, I don't think I have any custom actions here, but what I could do if I wanted to, I could create a new action on this, uh, on this, in this flow and in creating the action action, I can make it any combination of other things. For example, uh, let's see, oh, maybe I'll, maybe I'll just create action number one. So action number one, um, I'm going to create, okay. Oh, actually, okay. Actually, I'm creating action number two. Um, now what I can do is I can put in any number of sub-actions. So 
um, maybe on this particular subaction here, maybe I want to hide this swarm, for example. I want to hide um, swarm number, I think it's swarm number three. Uh, yeah, swarm number three. Okay, so I could hide an object. I could hide swarm number three if, if there was some re strange reason, reason why I wanted to do that. Okay, and then I can put in a, uh, an additional sub action. Maybe, a, maybe on this particular action, maybe I'm talking about something and I just wanna, I just wanna delay, let's say. Um, I, wanna, it's my, I wanna delay for three seconds. That's how long it's going to take me to discuss what I wanted to discuss. And then maybe my next sub action, maybe I want to unhide this object here. So I'm going to come back here. I'm going to, I'm going to add a, an additional sub action here. And now I'm going to say unhide the object. I hope there is a, there is such a thing. Let's see. No, maybe I'll just toggle it. <laughs> There might have been a. There might have been a. Uh, uh, there might have been. There maybe there's an unhide action. I just didn't spot it real quickly there. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to <clears throat> do this in, in action three. So I'm hiding the action. Um, I'm delaying, and then I'm going to toggle the action. Okay, and let me shift the order of these. I want my delay. After I hide the object, I want to delay three seconds, and then I want to toggle the hide show of that same swarm. So this is my action that I've got defined. So what I want, if I wanted to put this into my button, let's say uh, I'll, I'll create a new button here. So in this new button, I'm just going to label it. Uh, I'm just going to label it um, demo. This is a demo complex action. That's what's going to go on my button label here. And the action that I'm going to run is I'm going to run, run a specified custom action. And the particular action I'm going to run is action number two. So this is how I've got all this set up now. Let me put my button over here just so it's a little bit more visible. I'm going to have the button face the camera. OK, let's hold our breath and see if this works. Okay, Let me save this. So in case I need to do anything, I can get back. OK, I'm going to click this button. What should happen is this should disappear, and then it'll reappear in three seconds. OK, it did not disappear. And that might be because I just need to refresh my browser page. Let me do that real quick here. <clears throat> this, uh, this happens quite frequently if you're configuring complex actions. Uh, flow just needs to get kind of reset. So everything internally is appropriately structured so that it's gonna, it's, it's gonna do exactly what you wanna do. Okay. And hopefully this is gonna work. This is high risk behavior, a live demo, doing something you haven't done before with the same, uh, you know, with, with that particular sequence of, of things. So I'm gonna try it again. Demo complex action. There we go, it disappeared. One, two, three, okay. What, it disappeared for three seconds and it came back. So it did what I set it up to do. You know, I set it up to do kind of a nonsensical thing, but it, it illustrates the point of how you can use buttons, how you can compose complex actions, multi, multifaceted actions, and then how you can execute those multifaceted actions just by clicking the button. So how that's probably more than you really had bargained for, but hopefully we got in a little training on uh, use non-trivial use of buttons and actions too. Yeah, thank you. Looks okay. great. Okay. Okay. Let's see. Has Michael come back yet? Uh, let's see. Okay, I don't see Michael here, and I don't. I think Stephen came back for a while, and then I think he uh, he departed. So, um, let's see. I think. Uh, we might as well wrap up this session, unless Nate or Hal, if you have any other questions, I'm here to answer them. Bill, uh, in the agenda, it talked about a uh, poem per value and create story. Is that like uh, create a story? Is that tomorrow's agenda? Yeah, yeah. Michael is going to do a session tomorrow 
on Story Creator. Yep, the Create Story. This, okay. right? Yeah, he's going to take you through some special things you can do up here. This is really a good area for putting narration on your on your steps, and you can do other other things here too. So that's going to be tomorrow's topic, I think. Cool. Thanks. Okay, Nate. Much hey, well, appreciate it. Yeah. Okay. Well, good seeing you, Nate. And See let you. us know if you have any other questions. We're we're here to help you out. Thank you so much. Bye. Okay. Hey, thanks everybody. Have a have a good rest of the day. You too, Bill. Okay. Bye-bye.